Hello, and welcome to another training module. This module is on the best practices, qualities of effective teaching at the community college level, in particular at Lawson State Community College. Effective instruction is expected of all faculty members at Lawson State, whether full or part-time at the college. So let's take a look at some best practices. One of the first things that we want to stress to you is that all faculty should arrive to class prepared and demonstrate enthusiasm for your topic. Um, preparation, um, even just coming late, um, can signal to your students that either, number one, you're not fully um, vested in the course, which you know you may have just been running late, but it's just very important that you plan to always arrive to class on time because you don't want to send that message to your students that may not actually be accurate, but recognize that it is a negativity. I mean, it's a negative thing. Also, of course, be prepared. It is very important that students can easily detect an ill-prepared teacher. And one of the things that we want to stress is that never assume because you know your subject matter, you don't have to prepare for class. We know that all faculty at Lawson State are competent. All of you have gone through faculty credentialing process, so we know clearly that you're competent. But that doesn't mean that you shouldn't prepare for your particular class each time. Let me also stress that if you also have labs, such as if you're teaching biology or um, any class that requires a lab, that you always hold lab and you, you never cancel lab, and that you're also equally prepared for lab. So that, rem that, that might mean that you're, you're coming a little early to make sure everything is set up, but that things are ready to go when students walk into the laboratory. Also, know, adhere, and follow the course syllabus and the core requirements of the course. This is very, very essential. Uh, when we talk about academic freedom, uh, that has little to nothing to do with the curriculum. In other words, academic freedom is your ability to um, move freely within the classroom and actually decide how you would like to deliver the curriculum. But the curriculum itself and the standards within the curriculum, that is the ownership of the college to set forth. So that all instructors must adhere to the syllabus, syllabus and the requirements set forth in the syllabus. So that's very, very important. Lawson State, as you know, is an accredited college with transferable credit. Thus, adherence to the curriculum, which is outlined within the syllabus, is essential. So what's important for you to understand is that if we say that we're offering, for example, an English 101 class, and we have clear, specific guidelines. I'll give you an example. Let's say that all English students within an English 101 class are required to write five essays, and that's the requirement that the department has set. Well, then, as a faculty member, you must carry four with that. Uh, if, if it's required that you have to give a certain amount of tests on specific criteria, then you must adhere to that. And why that's so important is because much thought is given to those require, requirements within that course because we need those credits to actually transfer and we need to make sure that our students transferring from Lawson State to let's say Alabama A&M or an Auburn or a UAB, that those students have similar experiences and actually can perform on the four-year college level. Another strategy would be use the Socratic question technique when questioning students. So here we're, we're suggesting that you ask open-ended questions to ensure that higher order thinking is taking place in your class. So you, you want to avoid sort of the choral response when everyone's kind of shaking their head at you and saying yes all, all to get together collectively versus really asking some very open-ended questions as to why did you arrive at that. Um, you want to try with students to peel back the onion and get them to think and get them to process and get them to discuss in a deeper, more um, higher order thinking level. So that's another very important thing that we ask of all instructors. Also, take attendance daily and record attendance on your faculty suite page. And this is extremely important. Um, attendance 
and the accuracy of your attendance is very important. We do all attendance online. There's actually a integrity session on how to record attendance if you're not familiar with that. So make sure you do um, view that. But attendance is very important because it links to um, not, not only is a legal record, and it's very important that your legal records are accurate, but it also links to Pell Grants and um, financial aid requirements. So it's very important that you take daily attendance and you record it daily online. Provide students with immediate feedback on classroom assignments, quizzes, and exams. This is the cornerstone to effective teaching. I mean, you can be the the best, you know, animated instructor. But if you're not grading in a timely manner and you're not providing students with immediate feedback, you are not in any way an effective instructor. Um, not you personally, of course, but just in assessing a faculty member. So that the the importance of, you know, grading assignments, delivering them back to students in a timely may, way, and providing them with feedback that's immediate is essential if you want students to progress and if you would like students to learn effectively. So here's the feedback rule of thumb. If an assignment comes in on a Monday, ideally we would like that assignment delivered back to the students corrected by that Wednesday, especially if it's something small like a homework assignment. Homework is not something that we need to keep for a week or two. Also, if it's in on Tuesday, out on Thursday. Or if something comes to you in on Thursday or Friday, really it needs to be back to the students by that Monday. And it's not that we micromanage you and you know, and, you know know get after you if it's not done, but it, we're talking about good practices. If, in fact, you want your students, which we hope you do, you want your students to, to learn and progress under your tutelage. And the last, what we, we say is the, the latest time flip would be a week. Now, we do understand that in some classes, like, for example, English classes, some history classes, you may have major assignments like a, a written paper that will require, and, and beyond those classes, but will require you to really spend some time. In those situations when it may take you a week or maybe a week and a couple of days, it's just important to let students know when to expect that paper back and set that parameter so that students, the anxiety that they experience while you're grading their essays, that they are not experiencing too much anxiety. So you let them know, students, I will have this back to you by next Friday. That's always a good practice. Provide students with detailed feedback designed to assist students in improving. We talked about this briefly, but we're going to really kind of examine what I'm talking about here. Feedback, if you think about it, I want you to kind of reflect back on your favorite instructors or, or the instructor that provided you with, you would say, when you left the class, you really learned a lot. Those teachers clearly provided you with ample feedback. So let's take a look at what we consider to be ample feedback. Also, feedback, whether praise or constructive criticism, needs to be specific. And that's really what we're getting at here, that the feedback should be immediate and also specific. So let's take a look. Here's an example of what we could call poor example of praise. And you might be thinking, wow, I can actually give poor praise. <laughs> yes, you can. For example, here the teacher writes, good job, Kim, way to go. Now, it sounds very innocent. In fact, it sounds really great, but it's not specific. Kim is questioning, well, wow, the assignment was pretty large. What was good about it? So a better example of praise would be this. Good job, Kim. Your essay was organized and included transitions throughout, which established both flow and voice. And here, what you're doing is trying to get the student to, number one, understand what they did correctly, and also to reiterate the importance of continuing that. So it's very, very important. Let's take a look at an example of constructive criticism that's done incorrectly. Many times, out of just you know the speed of going through grading work, we tend to just want to put checks and X's and a number on top. But I want you to think about that. If you just put checks and X's and you put 7 out of 10 and we move on, you've lost the opportunity to really pinpoint what the student is doing wrong. It's not about just, you know, for the student it's about what they scored on a quiz. But for you as an instructor, it should be more than that. It should be, okay, let me capture what the student you know, scored, but also let me use this as a teachable moment for them because maybe I can still get them to improve what they missed. 
So if you notice under poor examples, you have things like incorrect or the X or try again, this is wrong. A better example of constructive criticism is, Tony, remember, when solving equations, apply the rules of signs properly. Review the rules of signs in chapter two. Notice here that the teacher did two things that I love. Number one, they specifically pinpointed for the student, in this case, Tony, what he did wrong, and, and that's why he missed some specific questions on the test overall. Also, they pinpointed to Tony where to go in the book to review. Now this is extremely essential and you can see that for Tony, if he gets this type of feedback, at least it will help to direct him on where he's having trouble. So he's not all over the map. Maybe he's thinking that he failed the test because he's just this poor math student, but actually he failed the test because he's not understanding the rules of signs. And that if he focuses in on, the, in, in on that, he can improve. So again, avoid simply marking answers on papers right or wrong. Rather, focus on providing students with ways that they can improve. We know you have to mark them right or wrong, but we're asking that you provide some kind of immediate and specific feedback for students so they can improve. Also, be readily available for students before and after class. We talked about earlier that you need to arrive to class on time. And actually, what we would prefer is that you arrive a few minutes earlier, so in case you need to speak to students before class and definitely lingering you know, behind a few minutes after class, that's a very good technique as well. Let's talk about Blackboard. It's extremely important that you upload grades in Blackboard weekly. Failure to post grades in Blackboard signals to your students that you are not focused on the class. Now again, it doesn't mean that you're not focused, but it, here we go again with the students interpret, interpreting behavior or lack of behavior in a negative way. In other words, if the grades aren't posted in your class, but all their other classes are posted, they, they're going to compare you. And um, whether that's important to you or not, you're missing the point on that one. What we're saying is this that part of your responsibilities as a new faculty member here at our college is the expectation that you will post grades in Blackboard. And students are aware of that expectation. So this is just something that I'm equating you with to understand that it's a responsibility and it's also a reflection of your teaching. Next, check email daily and respond to email within 24 hours if it's between Monday and Friday and 48 hours over the weekend. So while we don't expect you to necessarily check email over the weekend, it's important that you check it Friday and check it Monday and make sure you respond to students um, via email. Email is a wonderful way to communicate with students and engage them and it's just it's a great resource especially if they can't if, if say they missed you or you have a really busy load or maybe you're teaching between campuses so you know have have students to tell I mean tell students hey email me and that's a really good way to keep them in the loop communicate with students inside and outside of the class regarding school related issues and notice that I stress school related issues one of the things that you want to avoid is bringing up any you know personal um, business of yours and sharing that with students and what you'll find is that even though many of our students may even be our same age as instructors we still are their instructors so the rule of thumb here is simple communicate with students regarding what you teach and if you stay on that topic you're going to be safe you know it's just a it's just important to not turn yourself into a counselor even though we want you to communicate with students recognize your role we have wonderful counselors on campus we have the space center if a student has particular issues that they're dealing with advise them to go to the counselor advise them to go to the space center to seek help and that's so again even though we want to encourage you to communicate with students what we rather you do is provide them with the resources to handle any issues that they may be having that are external issues and that you pretty much just focus in on the instructional aspect or the courses that you're teaching maintain professionalism at all times and again I just said this avoid the sharing of personal and professional work related information with students now we're talking about work related so it may be um, work related maybe you're having a bad day those are again personal and shouldn't be shared with students and focus on providing students with examples 
isn't pseudo. So what you want to try to do, you can, a lot of teachers, which I think is a good technique, they like to pull from real life examples. But what we try to tell faculty members is to, you know, bring in another name. <laughs> Don't necessarily bring in your own personal um, experiences, or rather, you can bring in your personal experiences, but just change the name. So remember, conflicts do and may occur. So never engage in debate with students. The job of the instructor is to de-escalate conflicts. So one of the things that we want you to keep in mind is this. Number one, as a faculty member, you, you, you should never have to tolerate um, discipline issues in your class. We just don't tolerate it here on campus. We do have a disciplinarian board. And if you ever have a problem with a student, um, you need to apprise us, especially your department chair, of what's going on. And typically, it can be handled on that level. It's very rare that something would go to the disciplinary board. But you do need to recognize that we do have such a board. But the other issue I want to bring up is this. You know, never, as, it's, as, it's, as this slide reads, engage in debate back and forth with students. That's just never uh, comfortable. And the job of the instructor is to de de-escalate a conflict. So if you ever encounter a student who's upset, remember your role is to listen and to try to de-escalate that student. If, it, if you feel that it's not working, then what you want to do is pretty much separate from the student and get your department chair involved to resolve the matter. Also, never address a student issue in front of the entire class. Speak to the student privately outside of class or contact your department chair for assistance. We are dealing with, the, with adult learners and one of the things that you need to be aware of if you've never worked with adult learners, they can be extremely sensitive, especially if uh, they're kind of put on the spot. So one of the things, one, one great strategy is just never address a student issue in front of the entire class. Adult learners really don't like that. So that's just the best way I can say that one. So what you need to do, of course, is just to pull the student aside privately and take them outside of class and discuss whatever issue it is that you would like to discuss with the student. In terms of conflict resolution with students, focus on listening to the student's concerns without taking the matter personally. Oftentimes, students just want to be heard. That's what I have found and discovered, that if you simply just you know, kind of sit back and listen to what the student has to say and validate what they have to say, you may not necessarily agree with it, but we need to validate if they have a certain feeling. We can't just tell a student, well, you don't feel that way. You may not agree with how they feel, but it's important to at least validate how they feel. So reflect on what the student is saying and seek to resolve the conflict, if at all possible. If the conflict is not resolved, again, report the matter to your department chair immediately for help and support. Make sure all of your classroom rules are reasonable and fair because that's how they're going to be assessed if they're ever challenged. We look at are they reasonable, are they fair, and actually are they, are they normal in terms of what many community college instructors have in place. So, although Lawson State Community College supports rigor and understands the need to establish classroom rules, the college does not support rules that ultimately interfere or remove students from pursuing academic progress in the class. I'm going to repeat that one again. The college does not support rules that ultimately interfere or remove students from pursuing academic progress in the class. Rules should not be too punitive as to separate students from the learning experience. So I think that's a really good statement at the end. So if you have a rule and you're not really sure about it, like you think it might be too punitive, one of the things that you want to do is talk to another faculty member. I would say start there first, even before going to your department chair. Talk to, talk to other faculty members first about the rule and get some perspective. Then talk to your, then if you still have questions, then talk to your department chair. Um, about the particular rule. But one of the things that we look at is does that rule, is it so punitive that it hurts a student academically? And that's when um, there can be a question. So let's take a look at a few. These are examples of unsupported rules that are in direct conflict of our mission that we've encountered over the years. Preventing a student from testing because they are late to class. Now here's what we say on this particular issue. Uh, 
Typically, the way Lawson State faculty members in general deal with this kind of issue is that the student is allowed in class, but they are not allowed to make up the additional time that they've missed. So if a student came, comes to class, you know, it's five minutes late, what we don't want to happen is that you tell them, okay, you can't come into my class and you can't take the test. They're five minutes late. We rather you, you simply give the student the test, and then when you collect the test, you collect their, their test as well. So you, do, you don't have to add on the extra five minutes, okay? So if you think about it, students have paid for an education, they're in your class, and they, have, and they should be granted access to your class. So we typically don't appreciate if, in fact, students are being told they cannot gain entrance into their class and because of that they now have missed a test. Now if you have another procedure in place such as this, um, you're late to my test but because you're late you have to get tested on a different date or something like that, that may be you know, a workable solution. Next, locking the door on a student who is late to class. This is definitely not favorable. Again, students or who are late to class are subject to missing what they've missed. For example, if you gave a quiz that started at 8 o'clock and the student arrived at 8.10 and you've already collected up the quizzes, well they've missed the quiz. So they've already been penalized. But to suggest that they're 10 minutes late, the class runs for an hour and 15 minutes and they can't even come in, that is what we con considered a direct conflict to our mission not allowing a makeup test or work for a student who has been hospitalized or involved in an accident. We obviously don't want to encourage students from missing class. That's not the point of this statement. But what we're saying here is this. Sometimes students are in situations such as an accident or they're hospitalized and they have what we call a legitimate reason as to why they miss something. And we ask faculty members to please consider that when it comes to making up work. But again, we're not saying, oh, every excuse gets in. But we're saying when you have legitimate excuses and they are validated, then you need to consider those. Not accepting work that is submitted on the same day the assignment is due via other means of delivery. Blackboard. We do have Blackboard, and so one of the things that we're trying to um, really stress is for faculty to use Blackboard on the 24-hour clock, and this will really help to support the mission. In other words, if something is due on Thursday and um, the student is not able to come to, to come to class, or the student may have come to class that day, but they don't have their assignment, what we encourage many faculty to do is to allow other forms of delivery as long as it comes to, this, to that faculty member on the day that it's due. Through Blackboard, some teachers use email. So it's just really an, a consideration um, the, for the student who may have trouble or difficulty or maybe they had technical problems in getting the assignment done. So focus on enjoying your teaching experience and contact your direct supervisor if you are in need of materials and supplies. Remember, teaching is a road that is always under construction. So continue to improve professionally and seek out opportunities for growth to improve your overall effectiveness in the classroom. It's been a pleasure. Again, welcome to Lawson State Community College.